Hello, and welcome to the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke. And I'm James. And this week, we cover Maurice Sendek's 1963 children's book and Spike Jones's 2009 film of the same name, Where the Wild Things Are. Let the wild rumpus start! Yeah, first episode of the of the new year. Should be exciting. I know we got a lot we want to do this year, but we're going to kick it off with Where the Wild Things Are. And appropriately, this was one of my first books I can remember reading and loving. Yeah, me as well. Um my my I remember reading this with my mom. We would read this a lot. It was a go-to for sure. Yeah, and I I like to credit um there's a book called Dragon's Blood. Um, by Jane Yolin, I believe, that I like to credit as like one of my early fantasy novels that really got me into it. And that was because I went and checked it out from the library. So that, that was kind of like I was part of that process. But if you go back even further, you get uh, when my, my mother used to read books to me. And, you know, this was one of those that was like me learning to read and she also helped. And it's a book, uh, you know, about monsters and about an adventure. And in that sense, like, it is the very first early fantasy novel I read that really made me fall in love with the genre, made me want to write it, you know, which I still write today. Uh, so, yeah, I give a lot of credit to this book for being foundational for me. That's awesome, man. Yeah, it's it's so interesting because I remembered reading it growing up and stuff, and I remember the story, but I remember there being so much more as far as like the wordage goes yeah. i expected there to be more of a story there but I, I think that's a good credit to the illustrations and the drawings that go along with it because it's like the story is there between the pages whether it's words or not yeah the story yeah it's it's in the images i agree because yeah there really isn't a lot of text in this book at all uh, i think it's something like 300 words or something 330 or something like that um but we we did read it um i went and Pulled it off a shelf when I was at Powell's recently and just sat down and read it real quick um, just so I could have it fresh in my mind. And and I didn't remember it. You know what I mean? Like, I was surprised that I didn't remember it as well as I thought I might. But, I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised because I was really young when I read it last time. Yeah, it's it's very simple storytelling. And the same can be said for the for the film that goes along with it, which I hadn't seen. And I don't think you'd seen yeah, either, right? No, I had not. I had not seen the movie either. Um, which I should go ahead and say, like how we're gonna go about this this review. So it's a little different in that we're gonna cover we're gonna cover the story and the movie, which we don't normally do in one episode. Um, we are gonna do that for this one, and then we also saw a documentary called "Tell Them Anything You Want" that uh, was filmed by Spike Jones. I believe it was in the like months leading up to the filming of the movie as well. Yeah, it was great. I, I was really happy to have, have seen that in conjunction with this film in this in this children's book because i I didn't know much about about the author and he's very interesting guy super interesting and i have a lot to say about him as a person but i think first let's talk we're gonna first we're gonna talk about the book and then we're gonna talk about the documentary and we'll talk about maurice sendek the person and then we'll take a little break do our audible ad and when we come back from that we will launch into the movie talk um so just so you can be aware that's how we're gonna proceed so the the book is pretty simple, like you said. It's it's about a a boy who is being wild. He's wearing a, a like a wolf costume, and his parents, who we don't see, but they they get onto him and they send him to bed without his supper. And in the, his bedroom, he you know goes on a journey of adventure, but is like through his imagination. It seems his room kind of turns into a forest. And now he's on an island where the wild things are. And we meet these huge headed, bizarre looking creatures that, you know, uh, we can talk about later, but apparently were quite 
uh, scandalous and that they were deemed too scary and too monstrous for children. And one of the reasons why this book was uh, banned and kept off of uh, library shelves for a long for the first few years it was out until it gained popularity. But yeah, so he's there and he he becomes king of the wild things, and then uh, he there's a lot of talk about loneliness, and then he becomes lonely himself and he misses home and he decides to leave, which the the, the wild things are sad about. And then he leaves to return home, and when he gets back, he finds his supper waiting for him, nice and warm in his bedroom. And that's the book. Like you said, simple. Yeah, and I mean, it's I, I, we're probably not going to go too much in depth into the plot of the actual film, although it, it, it does add a lot. There are things we'll touch on, yeah. but very much the same thing. It's just a, a boy who ends up on this adventure with these these creatures and and. It is interesting to see that, like, I mean, I guess the the, the book did come out in the 60s, but, like, yep. a lot of creature, like, little things are what kids, like, kind of latch onto and, like, think they find them interesting because they're different. And, uh, like, I remember really, really loving this this as a kid. And, like, it was a, one of the ones that I would reach for to, you know, l- listen to my mom read or to read along with. And And I'm sure, honestly, in my house somewhere, we still have the copy of it. Yeah, and, and, you know, in the documentary, Maurice talks a lot about kind of his attitude towards writing children's novels, or children's books, I should say. And I think it comes through here. He isn't, he doesn't dumb it down for kids. Like, it, it I think the, I, the, the monsters being genuinely kind of disturbing and frightening is one of the things that made me want to read it. And the idea that he could befriend them and they could have a relationship even though they were so scary. There was something cool about that too. Like, um, you know, the world out there, the unknown being frightening, but being able to, to conquer it and to go on an adventure and, you know, flourish and make friends. And, and I don't know, there's just something so exciting about that. And I just, I I mean, I was a kid who loved short, like, um, ghost stories and monster stories. And uh, I used to tell ghost stories all the time. And I think that the appeal of monsters and creatures was always something that drew me to to horror and to, to fantasy early on. And that maybe all comes back to this book, right? This was probably my first book where I was really confronted with that. Yeah. And I, I completely agree with that. Like, it's, it's, I, I feel like I can point to this book and I, I can't remember many other children's novels that, that we read my family, like my mom or dad read to me. Um, but like this one stands out and it, it's so, like I said before, it's so interesting because it's just so, it's so simple. And I think it really has a lot to do with those illustrations with which the author drew as well. They're, they're amazing. The detail and the, the, the very unique style that he draws in, it really just like, it's captivating. Even now looking at it, I'm just like, of course I love this as a kid. It's, it's so fascinating to look at. Now, as an adult reading it, did you get something different out of it? I think so. Like, it, it, there was more of the themes of what he was trying to get across. Like you were saying, like the loneliness, the the ideas of like growing up and realizing that you're you what you do affects people, and what people do affects you, and and kind of uh, some of those themes I, I definitely notice more now. I, I likened it to analyzing a poem in that there's so few words that you can you can really put a lot into each line, right? And there's there's things like they name him the most wild thing of all. And so they make they name him king. And he gets put to bed when his parents call him a wild thing and he gets in trouble. So I like this idea of um acting out and being wild, which is a part you know, part of being a kid. And then going to a place where you're among other th- other creatures that are also wild. And it kind of gives you a home among these outcasts. And so it, to me, it's also kind of about acceptance and like, you know, understanding, appreciating that, you know, your, you, your wild tendencies and your spirit and everything isn't necessarily something that is you should be ashamed of, even if you got in trouble for it. Like you can still there maybe is another place for you and knowing what we know about Maurice from that documentary where his, his 
relationship with his parents was very strained. I think you clearly see a book about escape and about, you know, going somewhere in your imagination to to feel accepted and to feel uh yeah, like you're like you're not alone. And I, that's all there and it's interesting because it's all in these it's in very few words, but I think that like you can see that here. Um you also see a little bit of I I would say a hint of potential neglect on the part of the parents that maybe the home, you know, you have to read between the lines, but maybe the home life isn't great for Max. Um, now we do, he does get his supper at the end. So it's kind of a, like a happy ending, um, which, you know, for a ch children's book makes sense. But I, I think, yeah, if you read the between the lines, I, I think there's maybe something going on there, or at least he's trying to say that parents are imperfect and they can, lash out in anger too which we definitely see that in the in the movie yeah and in the documentary um he kind of addresses that he's like he talks about how in all the other kids books at the time they were basically just like the the parents were infallible yeah and then he was approaching it from a situation where the parents are people and they make mistakes and it's part of being a parent and uh, like that imperfection is part of what i think makes this story endearing and it's it's going to stick i mean it's all i think it's going to be popular for a, a long time coming uh wh what do you what do you make of the wild rumpus that's something that comes up in the movie again too like what what is that honestly i'm not really sure it just seems like that's like their way of like expressing themselves and and like just like letting everything out all these frustrations and the the energy everything pent up yeah kind of just letting all that out and just living free and being free yeah i like that like it's it's a release and it's mm -hmm. it's a way to yeah it's like the ultimate kid thing like that's what you would that's what you wanted right as a kid like you just wanted to go crazy sometimes and have a big party and the idea that you could have a big party with all these monsters and just like dance in the in the night and like uh, swing from the tree limbs and all this stuff yeah i think it's just a release and it's a way to bond with these with these new his new friends, um, and, and I, guess, I guess that's why because it's really kind of the main plot point, right? Like it all leads up to that, and then him becoming king, and then and then he leaves and he returns because he's lonely and he leaves behind his new friends who are sad to see him go. Um, what did what you make of that? Like what what can we what can we what can we glean from that choice? So something interesting that I like kind of got from it is that like he he he's growing as a person like that's part of your childhood is growing up and becoming the person that you will be so like yeah all of these fun times and these releases and these crazy things where you do whatever you want that's like part of being a kid but also part of being a kid is is moving on and and realizing that like certain things are important and i, I guess that's kind of what i got out of it is just that like there's more to childhood than just being a kid yeah it's a return to the real world it's you know it, you can have your fun but eventually he misses his parents and he misses being in the real world and so he returns you can't live in that fantasy world forever right like if we had ended and he had never left the island of you know the wild things that would have been a very different book mm -hmm. uh, all right I, I mean i think that's about all i have for the story itself now, this documentary is called Tell Them Anything You Want, filmed by Spike Jones himself, I believe. He's um, behind the camera most of the time. I think there's one other camera. And I was floored by this. And honestly, this documentary, I had seen most of it, and it was one of the things that made me want to do this project because I find Murray Sendek fascinating. I agree, yeah. I had no idea. I mean, I didn't know the man, uh, and I didn't know any of his other work besides where the wild things are and... Um... I didn't really know anything about him. So seeing seeing where he's come from, his his perspective on things and, and just the way that he uses his life and his in his work and he the way that he just openly says like I mean the title of the documentary, he's he says it in the documentary and I thought that was like the most powerful moment when he was just saying like he's like you need to tell kids whatever they like if it's true yeah. You need to tell them whatever it is they need to know. You know what I mean? If it's if it's hard for them to hear, it's hard for them to hear, but it's part of life and just tell them what they if you're honest, like they'll be accepting of it and and I think that's just like a a great way to to see that kind of 
like that kind of uh outlook on life so he died in 2012 i don't know if you know that um yeah at the age 83 so that was only three years after this film came out um he talks about death a lot in this documentary um and it seems to me like he is someone who suffers from depression and has his entire life um he he seemed fixated on death in the documentary itself and in in like almost i don't know kind of a heartbreaking way i i would say um mm-hmm. and it seems like he really struggled to find joy which when i hear that I, I immediately think like you have a chemical imbalance in your brain that's causing you to be depressed i i, I don't know i mean like I, not to minimize it but it just he he seemed like someone who who really struggled throughout life he um He's a homosexual man who never came out to his parents. Um, even they, they passed away without knowing. So he he had he says in the documentary he had a lot of shame. He still has a lot of shame about it, and that is sad to me too. Like it's this inability to accept yourself and to you know be proud of who you are, and I found that tragic as well. Um, he's this he's this really grumpy, interesting man who. You know, his parents, he talks about in the in documentary, his parents told him from a young age that they wish he'd never been born, that they should have, like, gotten an abortion. And just, like, he was basically raised by his siblings after that. Um, it, it's, uh, it was really powerful stuff. Yeah. It, I found it particularly interesting how he was so... His his siblings raised him, and and so much of what he became and did with his life was based on the way that his sister brought him up, or the way that his brother taught him how to make toys and draw, and and like that was I found that really really like nice to to see that like at least he had some sort sort of family that he that he had, um, and yeah, it was it was really sad to see that he had to go through all of that, and I mean he talked about it in the documentary that it was just a time period where. It, like he he felt like it was like he had to suppress it and he had to not tell anyone and be shameful of it which is just so it's just a, like what a life to have led like that's awful yeah and i mean he he makes the point that he wrote books books for children in the 60s and to come out as gay at that time would be you know it would have been a huge um controversy you know mm-hmm. i'm not saying it's right but it would have been and he knew that, and I think that's part of why he kept it, you know, under wraps. But uh, yeah, it's, it seems like it's something that he really struggled with his entire life. Now, this book is, you know, obviously he's most famous for it, and he talked about how it was really controversial when it came out. Um, he gives a lot of credit to his editor, which I thought was kind of a cool. You don't see, you don't hear a lot about those kind of relationships, you know, between editor and, and writer, and and she seemed to be really influential and in kind of giving him free reign to do the things he wanted to do and encouraging him to do it. And he even says like, this book wouldn't be, wouldn't be like this if it wasn't for her. So I thought that was a cool moment. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. He didn't have any children himself, you know, for someone who writes children's books. Yeah. And he even said like, he didn't particularly like children. Like he chose the career over children. And I found that really, really interesting because it's like how, that's kind of shows like he's not necessarily just writing he's writing books about childhood kind of but it's not necessarily just for kids and i think we see that with the film too oh man when he was talking about his dogs like the current his current dog is one thing but then he's talking about like his dog he had as a kid and how he's put that dog in every book he's drawn like in somewhere like mm-hmm. the, i mean i teared up i'm not you know i'm not ashamed to say it like that was like yeah. i mean we've talked about being dog lovers and and that that's a sure way to get me but man like that just the documentary in general is really emotional to me like it really hit home for me and hit me in the feels for sure you know what the part that we haven't really talked about that that got me too is that he had there's like no acceptance of success no acceptance of of any sort of accolades or anything like he he was like uh, he just like i don't know it was it was and spike jones like kind of at the end like got on him for it and was like look man he's like you've done all these amazing things and inspired so many people and he just felt like i guess he couldn't get out of the shadow of where the wild things are or and like a mixture of that not really being what he wanted i don't know it was it, it was just it was tough to see because it's like 
yeah. look at what this person created and he's he just he can't see it for himself what, how how great it is and there was a part where he was talking about and it was like he had had it was like a, there was a, a previous part where he had talked about how he like he can't find joy in like anything he does and it, like nothing makes him happy and and he has like a thing where he asks somebody like can you find joy and they're like yes and he's like fuck you or whatever <laughs> oh by the way he curses a lot in this documentary uh, I should say um, which is also surprising he then there's another part where he talks about he kind of does talk about finding joy and he was talking about when he goes to his room i think it was to write and like the finding joy in like the work and in the moment of creation and like being with his dog and just like the simple things and like his life and like looking out the window and like seeing the woods and stuff like there were these like simple moments that he seemed like he was able to find some joy which like that was kind of I mean, it was sad, but happy, too. You know, it was like a happy, sad thing where it was like I was happy for him that he could find it, but it was sad that it was so hard. Um, but also as a creator, like I could appreciate that. And, and I think that shows some of like what drove him to do the creative work he did in his life. Like that, those fleeting moments of creation that make you happy. And like that's probably why we have these books, you know? Yeah. Um, there was something on Wikipedia that I saw that was pretty cool that I wanted to mention here. This is a direct quote. He said, A little boy sent me a charming card with a little drawing on it. I loved it, and I answer all my children's letters, sometimes very hastily, but this one I lingered over. I sent him a card, and I drew a picture of a wild thing on it. I wrote, Dear Jim, I loved your card. Then I got a letter back from his mother, and she said, Jim loved your card, and so much he ate it. That was, to me, one of the highest compliments I ever, I ever received. He didn't care if it was an original Marie Syndic drawing or anything. He saw it, he loved it, he ate it. Which I just think that's pretty awesome because, you know, famously the, uh, you know, I'll eat, you up, I'll eat you up, I love you so line. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so perfect for this book. And then, yeah, the idea that he had our original drawing from, from this, you know, artist that who knows what it'd be worth and he just ate it. I don't know. There's something, there is something awesome about that. Yeah, it's fantastic. That's I, that's a, that's an amazing story, <laughs> and like without, it, I wonder if the kid realized like the impact that that was that he had doing that because like he was obviously going off the story. Yeah, and I don't know. I don't that's know. awesome. But yeah, I mean, and it's, and it's her, <laughs> Maurice loved it. Like it was his favorite thing. So <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yeah. yeah, he 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 is an atheist. Um, I, I think that was hinted at in the documentary. I don't know if they come out and say it, but I saw that on Wikipedia. Yeah. Oh, do you remember that story he tells about? when he threw when he was like playing catch with another kid and he threw the ball and the kid ran out into traffic and got killed it was that yeah, coupled was with brutal. the story of the Lindbergh baby that was like also just astounding cuz it's a really insight into him as a kid and like what changed his life mhm mm those two events really both seem to be huge right yeah and he's like he's like transfixed by death as a kid and like it they had they had said like he was always like that it wasn't just that he was getting older like he was always talking about death and and i think those things affected him i mean he talked about having seen the whole story about the the corpse of the child the the baby that was stolen and having seen it and nobody believed him and then being validated that was like yeah it was wild because when I story. when I heard him say that, I was like, nah, that, there was no way you imagined it. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, there's no way they actually put that on a like a, a magazine or whatever, actual yeah. picture of a corpse of an infant. But apparently, I mean, it's revealed in the documentary that he was later validated that they really did do that for like a very brief, like literally the morning issue had it. And then there was a scandal and they replaced it by the afternoon. So it was immediately so taken off stands. But he did see it as a little kid. Yeah, I mean, I, we can move on from this. I, I just, I feel like if you love this story, if you love this movie, do yourself a favor and watch this documentary because it is absolutely worth it and, and, and really, really good. Yeah, you owe it to yourself to get to know this guy. Like, I, I'm i blown away. Like, he's now an inspiration to me more than I ever could have thought, you know? I just thought it was a, ch a children's novel that I read growing up and, and now it means so much more to me and he's a fascinating person. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll end it by saying I read a note on, uh, on Wikipedia too, that the film her, which you, is also Spike Jones and I haven't seen, but mm -hmm. you have seen. Yeah, it's great. Um, he, he was dedicated to Maurice Sendak and James Gandolfini. 
who wow. who uh, had passed away by the time they made that too. I didn't know that. All right, uh, let's take a moment talk to you about Audible, and then we'll get back to and we'll we'll jump into the movie. So we have an Audible affiliate link. It's audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film. And with that link, you can get a 30 free day trial and a free credit for any any audiobook in their collection. Yeah, and I thought I'd go ahead and recommend a children's fantasy series that I my mother read to me, and I think I read a couple myself, um, that is still ongoing. It is called Redwall by Brian Jacks. I'm not sure how to say that last name. Jax? J-A-C-Q-U-E-S. I'm probably butchering that. Um, but... He, uh, it's, it's a, it's a series of novels about these little mice and they basically do fan, like normal fantasy novel things. They go on adventures and they have sword fights and they're magic users and everything. But yeah, if you like Google them, they, there's little pictures of like all the covers, there's these little mice dressed up in fantasy outfits and stuff. And it's, it was just a lot of fun. And I remember really enjoying it. And, um, I know my wife read a bunch of them when she was younger and they're just a cool series. You could definitely get that. It's on audible. Uh, the very first novel is called Redwall. And yeah, you can get that on Audible with audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film. You can get that for free and have three free 30 days to listen to it. All right, so next up, we're going to finish up by talking with the, about the movie. And I thought I would introduce it by reading a bit of feedback we got. Um, this is from comes from Alex, who I know through school. Uh, we went to, we, we got our... Uh, creative writing masters together um and he wrote in uh this which i'll go ahead and let him intro this this movie he says so this book and movie mean a lot to me and the strange thing is that it didn't mean a lot to me until i saw the movie as an undergrad in college it sounds super strange and kind of stupid maybe but i watched it for the first time during a college movie night and i grew up with the book like anyone else my age but the movie spoke to me there was a lot of Max that I can relate to, and growing up and bullied, there was an indescribable rage and sadness that I felt a lot of the time and couldn't translate into any other experience. This movie and story for me is a, is a tale about letting go, accepting, and being yourself even when you have to recognize your faults. So yeah, I really liked that. Like that I think that does cut to the heart of this movie. And and you definitely see a lot of, I think Max is a character that is, you know, prone to fits of rage and and just over energy. Like he's he's wild. And I think that that really comes across in the movie. And I can definitely see identifying with that. Yeah, I mean, I I actually really agree with what he wrote in because I feel the same way. Like it was it was kind of a book that. I guess it's just you don't appreciate certain things when you're when you're that young and like I I don't remember I love the book but I don't remember ever being like affected by it in any like profound way until and I hadn't seen the movie until until we just watched it and and it was really an interesting experience because it was not what I was expecting the the book or sorry the the film was much different it was much more it, 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 I'll, we can get more into the, the the ins and outs of the film, but it was much more serious and much more um, kind of thought provoking than I thought that it would be. I thought it would be more of a straight up kids film. So yeah, let's let's first talk about Spike Jones a little bit. Um, t- tell me about him. I know he's done some really like kind of out there movies that honestly I'm a big fan of, but this is like a weird kind of departure from what I was expecting from him. Yeah, yeah. This is very like it it screams indie and it was it was like an 80 million dollar film. And like wow. it's very like it, it's like the way that he like moves through the scenes and lets things play out and lets there there's it's almost like the the book in the way that there's not all that much talking. There's a lot of moments that that draw th- it just brings certain things to mind. So you think about like what this kid's going through with his his parents being divorced and and him like i like connecting with these characters that he meets that are like kind of uh, what i got out of it was they were kind of like um pieces of his own personality that were like that were like shown on display so he it's just it's just so interesting to see a film that's based on a children's novel that's that's allowed 
to breathe from scene to scene and not kind of holding your hand not to say that like a lot of kids movies do that but it does happen but just like there was almost no hand holding it was a lot of just experience and i thought that that it was very well shot and spike jones is a guy who like at the, i'll watch anything he makes and and the fact that i hadn't seen this it was always one that was on my list this movie visually is just arresting and that was the thing that made me made it there was a reason I always wanted to see this, and that was whenever I saw the trailers for it, I remember being blown away by how it looked. It just looks incredible. I mean, just the scenes of the of the forest and the creatures and how real they are. Like, and and um, I'm sure you saw this in your research, but they, they were all people wearing big suits. Like, these were all physical things, not just CGI creatures. You know what I mean? And I think that really helps. They CGI'd the mouth and faces stuff some, but like yeah. they were wearing actual suits. There's a crazy story behind all that. So Jim Henson is the creator of you know Sesame Street, The Muppets, mm-hmm. a visionary, um, like completely unbelievable person. Uh, did so much good for film and and specifically practical effects and practical puppets and or Muppets. And the Jim Henson Company created these Muppets for for oh, people cool. to wear and perform during during the film. And uh, apparently it was going to be full on practical. There was going to be no CG. But when they got the suits, the performers said they were all complaining about how it was way much too heavy to perform in because there was so much animatronics in the face because they wanted to get all of the all of the like subtle um, emotions in the faces. They wanted it all to be like controlled by mm-hmm. animatronics. And so what ended up happening is it was too much for the performers. So they had to pull all those animatronics out and then create like blank faces that they would later CG over. Oh, wow. And what's funny to me, what I find super interesting uh, is that it kind of works better than for me. Like something about the creatures is like it's very like off. And I think it has something to do with it being that, that mix of practical and CG because sometimes the... I, it just because it, I could I, it, it was blurring the lines between CG and and I, I when I was watching it I was like I can't tell if this is full on CG yeah. or if this is some sort of sort of people performing and then when I looked into it afterwards I was blown away that it, it was people in there and just, uh, super interesting yeah really cool now I wanted to touch back on something you kind of alluded to where you were saying that the the creatures were parts of his personality and I like that a lot and I think. You know, I think that and possibly people he knows, like his sister and his mother and the boyfriend, which, by the way, Mark Ruffalo. Did you did you catch that? That's who that was. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> um, I was like, oh, look, it's the Hulk. <laughs> um, Hulk. But yeah, it, uh, it, it I like that a lot. And I think that's something that is. It's like an easy step to go that that was what the book was, but. If you think about the book, we don't have really a basis to say that for sure. Whereas in the movie, I do think that that is more obvious. Uh, Carol is uh, the kind of the main wild thing. And I very much think that he is representative of um, Max's anger and his right. his wildness, but also in like his anger with his mother and his anger at the world and being like being lonely and being angry about being lonely. And we see a lot of that play out in the story in the story that happens with Carol and his wanting everybody to be together and not liking outsiders, which, by the way, uh, the outsiders were those like two little weird owls that just like grunted and stuff. Mm-hmm. Did you look at the end where it where it had a, like who who made those? It was Spike Jones. Yeah, it was him. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. I just like I, I would like I know that he's also a performer, so like I love to see directors get involved. Like um, Taika Waititi and in, in Thor Ragnarok recently as Korg was amazing. Oh, yeah. Like any time that that a director has has the confidence to jump in their own movie, I feel like it's. I mean, sometimes I guess it can be kind of vanity, but I don't yeah. think in the, these two cases it was. Well, in that uh, that case, I mean, like these are just little owls that grunt. Like they really which don't is say so anything. Funny. Yeah, but it's just funny that he was the one who made those noises. Or uh, another one. What's the actor or the director who did uh, Guardians of the Galaxy? Because he, uh, Gun, yeah, James all Gun. of the baby Groot dancing was him. Yeah, which so I funny. think is awesome. Like it was like he like secretly recorded it too because he didn't want anyone to see it because he was embarrassed or something. Like I don't know. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> Anyway, we're getting we're getting in the weeds a little bit, but yeah, it was like that, you know. But he's he's the voice of these like weird owls that um, 
What's the what's the what's the I should have written down written, written down all of the names of the characters, but I didn't. The 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 Carol the one that uh, the one that Carol is, wants to have stick around, but is KW. friends with the era. owls. KW. KW. Yes, yeah. KW. Now I think KW is representative of his mother, right? And with his the... relationship with her, mm-hmm. and because a lot you know she's the one who's having friction with Carol, right? And mm-hmm. you know it's very telling. I think that he, to hide from Carol when Carol kind of loses it and chases him, he hides in the gullet of his mother. If you want to say that, KW. Mm-hmm. Like maybe his mother's love being his protection from his more wild side. I don't know. It's it, you, there's just, I think there's if you wanted to take the symbolism and and really kind of do that, like you could write an essay about this movie in that way. Yeah, that's and that's what I mean about like Spike Jones went the extra mile to to make sure that there was more to this story than what was immediately present in the novel in the yeah. Dick Child's book because I mean he extrapolated out some things that were completely in line with what what he was trying to tell with where the wild things are the the children's book it's like it, everything fits so well and i was so impressed yeah and and really like it's still also um faithful to the book the right. monsters look just like like they look so much like they do you know and the the down to the to the weird kind of wolf costume that he's wearing looks like it was just right out of the book definitely and uh he gets that crown and that scepter i mean there's so many cool things with that um where i loved that he stuck to that original vision you know marie syndex original vision absolutely and i I actually really love the relationship between the jones and and syndex like in the documentary and, and you can see how much he loves the source material and loves him and I just thought that was such a great pairing. Um, I was doing some research and I found that uh, Sendek actually handpicked Spike Jones. He was like, the the film had been in production. Like, they were trying to find a director. There were rumblings of, of it being adapted for like 20 years. And uh, I guess Sendek saw something he really liked in Spike Jones and handpicked him to make the film. Well, we didn't talk about it, but he previously did uh, Being John Malkovich and Adaptation before this, right? Right. And those are both just like incredible works of art that are just bizarre. I mean, part of that's Charlie Kaufman who wrote those movies, but directed by Spike Jones, you know, so you got to give him the credit in taking that weird vision and making it into what those movies are. Just, yeah, I think, I think he's brilliant and it's really interesting to see him away from Charlie Kaufman do this and have it be so cool. And then I haven't seen her, but obviously that's another thing that he did on his own. You'll, I mean, you'll love it when yeah, I guarantee it. it. It's very much like hit Spike Jones, and I mean, it, it deserved all the praise that it got, in my opinion. Yeah. Did you no? Did you catch? This is also just a random kind of Easter egg, but there was like a giant dog in the desert at one point. Yeah, he's I didn't like, know yeah, what don't to feed it; it'll stick around. It was huge. It was this huge. Like, it was just was it just supposed to be his dog back home? Maybe, yeah, Max's dog, or yeah. I was thinking maybe it was Spike. Um, doing an homage to uh, Maurice Sendak's dog, who was in all of his work. Okay. Because like, yeah, you see it kind that. of from the side, and it almost looks like a big Star Wars creature or something. You can't really get a good look at it, but I could see it kind of being this like schnauzer-type dog. Yeah. Just like a giant version of it. Yeah. And then, yeah, the um, the cave with all the, like, the stick model. Like, I can't even imagine the hours that had to go into making that, because like, you could tell that was a real thing that they built. Yeah, I actually and, really like that scene too. Yeah, where they were he showing sticks his all head that. up, and then the water. So cool! It's it was so well thought out, so well shot. It's just great directing. Uh, there's a couple other things I wanted to say that I found in my research. Um, apparently, Warner Brothers was so he had to shop this from Universal originally was going to do it, and then Warner Brothers decided to do it. And apparently the original cut of the film Warner Brothers was so unhappy with, they they gave him like an extra like five or ten million dollars to go do some reshoots, like extensive reshoots. And mm-hmm. the movie was pushed back like three times, once from early early 2008 to late 2008 and then to, to some point in 2009. And the reshoots were apparently done because Warner Brothers felt like it was it was there was nothing for kids in it. Like it was very much an adult film yeah. with very adult themes and they were they were not happy with it. And that does seem to be the kind of the legacy of this movie that I was reading online is that people don't know what to make of it. And when I w- one of the things that I wrote down after I finished it was, wow, what a surreal movie. 
Mm-hmm. And I just kept coming back to that. Like, it's you have to embrace the kind of just bizarreness of it. And if you sit down and break it down to its parts and think about what it all means, you can find like plot and meaning there. But in the moment, it's kind of hard. Like you, you, it's it's just him with these creatures. You don't know what to make of them. The world is very bizarre. You don't understand what the rules are. Everything looks beautiful, but there is something, yeah, just really kind of bizarre about the whole thing. And I could see that being off-putting to a child, especially trying to watch this movie. And it seems to be that seems to be kind of the critical rub for this movie is that people say this is supposed to be a kid's movie, but I don't know that children are going to enjoy it. Yeah. Well, I think I think that that Spike Jones made a like he made the decision to make it not a not just a children's uh, film. He uh, like apparently like he wouldn't budge with the studios. They they wanted him to reshoot like a ton of stuff and make it a full on kids movie, and he wouldn't he wouldn't budge. And uh, I think that I read the production budget was a hundred about a hundred million dollars, all things considered, and the movie made about a hundred, all things considered. So at the end of the day, I think everybody everybody who needed to get paid back got paid back and we got a really interesting unique film out of it and i, I don't know it, it just it's a very like i don't know that i can point to another film that's similar to this in, in yeah. almost any way that's true um I, I yeah i also wanted to say like it's it's this is an example of a creator sticking to their guns and i i love that because i think when you're working with maurice sendak who we just watched that documentary on you know that man and you're doing his work, like, you have to stick to your guns. Just, if, you know, in homage to him, to the source material. Like, he's not someone who is going to budge. And, yeah, I give Spike Jones a lot of credit for not budging. Now, could you argue that he might have made it into a movie that would have made more money? Yes, I, I think that could be true. But would it be as memorable and maybe as artistic a film? I don't know. It's debatable, you know. And I tend to think that I, I, I'm glad... He, I'm glad he went this route. Um, it's interesting because like this isn't a movie that you would say is among like the Pixar films, right? In your rotation of just like movies that your kids love. Like this movie isn't going to fit there, not really. Right. Yeah. But it's its own cool thing that that I appreciate that I love that it that this film exists. Definitely. It it yeah. Just all in all, it, it just it is an experience, and I, it was one that I was not expecting because like I said going into it i thought it was going to be a, a children's film and, and it was very much more just like a you take out the creatures and it's it's just like an indie f- film about some like a like a coming of age tale of yeah. of a kid dealing with the things that a lot of people deal with and like i mean i can i can relate to it um in a lot of ways just because it's like uh, in the in the the book as a kid you kind of relate to him because like he he it's more implied like the the way that you relate to him is more implied in my opinion and then in this you get more of it where it's like acting out and i think every kid has a little streak of acting out and just like not like the parents and the kid not really being on the same page 100 percent of the time and and things happening and i mean i it's just it's very relatable and and i i thought it was a really powerful film it just it was not what i was expecting in any way so i was it was a fun surprise yeah, and, and I mean, speaking of fun surprises, there were a few that I just wanted to highlight. Carol rips uh, the arm off of one of the other characters, and and I wish I'd written down the name. I think it's like the bird one. I don't remember what yeah, his name was. Yeah, I think was. the bird one's name Douglas is like or Alex? Douglas. Yeah, I think so. so Douglas. I think so. He rips his arm yes. off, and like when he rips it off, like sand spills out, or like some sort of like dust. Yeah. And Which I um, thought was wild because at one yes. point in the doesn't somebody talk about like everything turning into dust at some point and how yeah, like you're right with, with the whole the like sand. earth there and the sun like going dark and that he hears in school <laughs> and yeah. all that stuff which is an interesting like you know that's uh that's max being confronted with death in a way that maurice was confronted in death like a similar but different kind of way yeah and yeah i mean in 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 you know carol gets really upset about it and that's it's another sign of carol being kind of an extension of him right Carol gets really upset about the idea that the sun the sun isn't going to come out and and he 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 frightens Max and then Max wants to have like a secret hole in their home that he can kind of hide in and then Carol gets offended by that and he wants everyone to stick together and he doesn't like the idea that you know he's lied to him and that he's actually afraid and so that that's that really complicated thing with 
with the mother, right? Like loving the mother, but also the mother getting angry at you for acting out, and the ang- and the mother maybe also seeking, you know, the boyfriend and like uh, affection elsewhere outside of your group. So yeah, it's it's you know you can you can dissect it you know all you want, but it, I agree that that seems to be very meaningful in the plot of what happens on the island. Oh, and also uh, when Max goes into KW's belly, it's like made of like this like cloth. Now he does get kind of like wet too while he's in there, so I wasn't really sure how that worked, but it was cool because you could see that it was almost like a bag he was in. So like they leaned into that idea that these things are like creations, you know, like uh, yeah. not organic, mm-hmm. which was just a really cool, I don't know, like uh, consistency with how they look. I don't know. I just thought that was really cool. Really cool. I agree. That was. I was really. I. I didn't know what to expect when he was getting swallowed, and then we got that shot from the inside, and that may have just been a shot from inside the puppet, for all we know. But, <laughs> Who knows, man? I mean, it was a crazy. It was. It was cool. It looked like maybe it was too. It was too big. Yeah. For him, like it was almost like a like a <laughs> bag of holding in there, you know, where it was like mm-hmm. bigger that, than it seems. Um, a little Tardis action, a little bigger yeah, on the inside. Yeah, Tardis. Yeah, exactly. Uh, oh yeah, and then later Douglas has a stick shoved in the in his like where his arm it was and his he just has a fake stick as his arm yeah. now that was hilarious yeah i don't know i really appreciated that um so yeah max decides to leave at the end of the movie and we get the line um from kw where she says don't go i'll eat you up i love you so and i mean there's a poetry to that line that i think is really beautiful but beyond that that's kind of the idea here is about his love for his mother has been causing him to act out and like he bites her in the movie. And it's the idea that it's, it's kind of like, um, of mice and men. So yeah, of mice and men. And it's the same kind of thing where it's like, you can love something and, and that love can cause you like lead you to harm it accidentally. Right. And I think that that in that line is kind of highlighting that. Right. And that that's how he feels like he loves his mother so much that he uh, causes her pain kind of unintentionally. Yeah. That was a powerful scene. I like that scene a lot too. That was a, that was probably one of my favorites. Yeah. He, when he's sure. leaving and you get to see the, cause it is, it's like we said with the book, it's like that he's, he's grown. You've seen his character arc. He's now, you know, he's seen what it can be like to be on the other side of what he's doing. When Carol is all upset and coming after him, he's seen what it's like to be on the other side of, of his own actions, basically. Yeah. Now, did you know that Forrest Whit- Whitaker was the one of the voices? In yeah, this the, movie? the big soft-spoken one, right? No, it's, so it's um, he's Ira, who was um, it was uh, Judith and Ira, and Judith mm-hmm. was the one who was like, kind of like wanting, like threatening to eat Max early on, and it was like yeah. the, they were like a couple together almost. Mm-hmm. He was the other one. Gotcha. So he wasn't the big, the big like quiet one that almost didn't say anything the whole time. Because mm-hmm. I thought at first that was him too, but no, he was he was the other guy who actually does. Kind of, he's kind of mopey, when he, but he does talk. Yeah, that was uh, this, apparently a pretty Whitaker. good cast. Uh, like Gandolfini was in this, yeah. and Forrest Whitaker, Paul Dano is is a great actor. He he played the little goat. I got to give uh, Gandolfini a lot of credit for this too, because this is not what I would expect from him. I've seen him in a lot of stuff, and he tends to play this, like, you know, he's a Sopranos character. Right. Everything I see him in, he's some version of this guy, this gangster type, or he's some sort of bad guy, or maybe, like, a cop who's, like, kind of out of control. And he's kind of typecast in a lot of these roles, right? That is not who he is in this movie. Now, yes, there is that, like, I think he brings that anger to it really well, where he's kind of genuinely frightening. But there's a side of Gandolfini here that comes through that I really... I don't know. I, I really liked it. And I thought I'd give him a, give him props for that. Um, yeah, and it's sad. I'm not really sure what year he passed away, but it, it must have been a few years after this because this was 2009. Yeah. So I think he it was probably 2014, 2015, okay. maybe. Yeah. So yeah, it was. It's sad to think about this movie too being you know one of the last things that. And I know it wasn't because he did another movie that came out, but one of the last things he did. Um, one of the last things that Maurice Sendex uh, saw of his own work. Um, mm-hmm. I know it was a big thing, and he 
he kind of had he was very dismissive of the people who criticized it as not being a children's book he was just kind of like screw them (laughs) you know yeah um he doesn't yeah he was unapologetic about it and he loved the movie he thought that uh spike brown i read that he, he thought that spike jones's vision was brilliant and that he he loved that he brought his own artistic flair to it to make it his own thing and he was someone it was interesting i read that he um because he was on set and stuff and he worked with them on on coming up with the story and he would always tell spike to not worry about the not about the children's book so much because he felt like spike was trying to be overly faithful and he kept pushing him like so it's the opposite of what you expect right Right. he was like no 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 just change it you know (laughs) he was telling him he was he was encouraging him to change things that's awesome. I mean, that's like what, uh, the stamp of approval that I would be looking for as a filmmaker is from, you know, the person who created the source material. And if they like it and you f- you're proud of it, I mean, that's all you can ask for. For sure. All right, man. I mean, that, this is about all I have. Do you have any more notes or tidbits you wanted to talk about? No, I think I kind of dropped in all the ones that I wanted to mention. There's some other little stuff here and there. Like uh, I'll mention this uh, uh, for, for a while. This was going to be a straight up animated film. It's going to oh, be made as an animated I thought, film. I thought it had been made into a cartoon at some point in like the so 70s. I think Disney did a like a short um, kind of short film about it, kind of test footage of what it would be. And I think you can find that test footage on YouTube. And I think that was in like the 80s. And it was they were it was on its way to become an animated film and people kind of pushed against that. But yeah, all in all, I, I mean, I really enjoyed this film. I'm glad we covered it. It was it was surprising. It was different than I thought it was going to be. And I think that's what this podcast is for is just to experience some some stuff that you weren't expecting like like uh, I like yeah. we have we've had our diehards we've had our which you know we read the book for that would inspire Die Hard and now we've seen the film that inspired a, a children or the film that was made after a children's novel that we both read growing up. Yeah. I mean it, this was a lot of fun very different from what we've done in the past and I, I think continuing to do things that are outside our comfort zones and a little weird, I think, is something I absolutely want to continue to do. Um, speaking of future projects, um, we know for a fact we are doing Altered Carbon uh, in a few weeks here. We're going to start on that. But there is a two-week gap where we're going to cover something, <laughs> and then we're going to cover a movie. But we are, we've are we narrowed it down to a few titles, but we haven't yet decided for sure what we're going to do. So we're going to announce that on social media. We're going to talk about it some more over the next day or two, come to a decision, and announce it on social media. So uh, we can't say yet what it'll be, but um, look look for either on Facebook or Twitter, which um, we're at Ink to Film on both. Uh, find us on there. You can find us on Instagram at the same place. And if you go there, you, you can find out what our next project will be. Yeah, and if you wanted to get in contact with us, you can always send us a message on there or, or comment on anything we post. And also, if you wanted to get in touch with us, you can send us feedback to inktofilm at gmail.com. Uh, Which is how Alex did uh, his feedback, by the way. So, yeah, Yeah. if you want to do that for a future project, uh, we could potentially, you know, feature your comments just like we did him. Um, We really appreciated that. I thought that was really added something to this discussion. Definitely. Uh, Thanks, Alex. That was that was a great, insightful uh, look like perspective. Yeah, I love to hear that that we're covering something that is important to people. and, And I know people have, you know, strong feelings about these different titles. And so I always love to hear that. Um, yeah, and if you want to support this podcast, if you enjoyed this episode, uh, so make sure to subscribe. And if you could, leave us a rating and a review. Um, or if you like this one that comes to us from Kyle on iTunes, five stars. He says, amazing podcast. Great podcast to listen to and read along with. So many times they have pointed out things I didn't notice or just interpreted a completely different way. You can tell both of them are super knowledgeable in their respective fields. That's a perfect review. We love that. So thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And we also wanted to say thank you to Ross Bugden for the use of our intro and outro music. Also, thank you to Audible. Uh, they provided us with an affiliate link, audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film, where you can get 30 free days and one free credit for any audiobook in their collection. Yeah, we hope you use that. Every time you do, it helps us out a lot, helps uh, keep us going, keeps the keeps the lights on for this podcast, so to speak. Yeah. All right. I guess that's it. Uh, We will see you next week with our project that we have yet to decide. (laughs) But until then, I'm Luke. And I'm James. See you guys.